Today's video is an interview with Irily Andrzejewska, who's a physio of 25 years, who also has a real interesting perspective on persistent pain, is involved with uh, treating patients with these conditions, has her own experience of recovery from uh, what is classically a, seen as a mind-body syndrome, and she describes that in the video. And also the third section is where I ask her the questions that lots of people ask me, and her perspectives on uh, the, these answers are really fascinating to listen to. So if you're interested in just another perspective on persistent pain, which matches my own, and we are training in similar fields from a physio perspective and from a surface perspective, and we do another training around this area, then it's a great listen. So thanks very much for joining me, really. Um, I, I love talking about pain and I get the idea that you like talking about pain. So anybody who comes across this who's interested in pain, whether a patient or a clinician, um, I, I think they'd like your perspective because I'm interested in it. And there's a few things I'd like to explore with, if that's okay. Yeah, that's right. So I'd like to know a little bit about you. Um, and I know a little bit myself, but if you're happy to introduce a little bit about you as a clinician. Um, I'd like to know about your uh, recovery story because it's fascinating and it's something I've never come across in with that specific condition. Yeah. If you're happy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'd also like to um, do a little bit of role play at the end okay. where I'm going to be the patient. Okay. And yeah. I'll, I'll throw you the kind of questions that I get asked. Sure. And sure. there'll be similar ones that you get asked, I guess. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, it's a framework of what we'll do. Perfect, thank we'll you. So tell me a little bit about you then and your professional work. Sure. Um, um, I'm a physiotherapist. I trained in Sydney because I'm Australian, but I've lived in this country for, I don't know, almost 30 years now. So I'm probably more British than Australian now. And um I've been mostly working in private practice during my career in musculoskeletal um, field. And a couple of years ago, I was getting, I almost left the profession um, because I've always strived to, you know, be the best busy I can. I've been on hundreds of courses all my career. And I was getting kind of a bit sort of dissatisfied that despite all this learning and training, uh, that, it was really upsetting me that there was patients that I didn't understand or um, I didn't want to, I didn't like to have patients keep coming back with the same problem. I didn't like managing pain. I wanted to find a solution that I'm a problem solver at heart. So I really wanted to solve the problem of chronic sort of persistent symptoms. Um, and so I, I got to the point where I thought I'm going to change profession. I really, this isn't satisfying me. And I almost applied to um, do a physician's associate course thinking Maybe I'll just go in the front end and, and be at the sort of triaging diagnostic um, sort of phase, which interestingly is completely the opposite end of where I've ended up now. <laughs> and um, and it got to a critical point where I, I, you know, I had to make the decision. And then I when it all came to a head, I thought, no, that's not what I want to do after all. And um, so then I started reading more widely and I came across um, the explain pain information, the curable app. Um, Dr. John Sarno, and then ultimately Georgie Oldfield. And as soon as I, so I was doing all this reading about sort of the mind body and this type of thing. And um, I thought, I've got all this extra information. What do I do with it? How do I do this stuff? And then, so when I came across the SERPA website and saw there was a course to um, be get the accreditation and doing this type of work, I instantly got my credit card out like 10 seconds later, which is very, very unlike me. And um, I knew that was exactly what I was looking for to sort of formalize all this knowledge and, and put it into practice and to join a community of like-minded um, practitioners in doing this work. Because otherwise you feel like you're just completely on your own with this information and, and this approach. Um, so I did that and um, I now see clients online, but I also, I still work at the private practice and that's been a challenging time to kind of bring this work into a very biomedical setting. Um, 
there's been lots of lessons learned along the way. Uh, and the main one being that it was really hard when a client came in and I had this whole new vision and they were coming in, having already Googled what was wrong with them, have already Googled what the physio should be giving them. And so when they turn up and I don't give them the set of exercises that Dr. Google said they get, that, that caused a bit of confusion um, for them. And so I realized, and, and I felt like, do I give them what they want or what they need? <laughs> it was kind of that type of thing. And at the time when I first started, I was very passionate about it and I wanted to give them what they needed, not what they wanted sort of thing. Um, but I found that I only worked with clients who already knew me and trusted my opinion for someone I'd never met before. They would be like, you know, they were just so, so surprised by a different approach that that didn't sit so well with most of them. Some of them did, but a lot of them were like, mm, I don't know. I've got, I've definitely got, you know, a piriformis problem. Why haven't you got your elbow in it and giving me piriformis stretches, you know? So, um, I realized that was the wrong client. That was, I was sort of fishing in the wrong sea, if you like. So now I've um, very much more on the website where I work set up and explain what I do so that people, if they want me and my approach, that they're going to find me that way rather than sort of me surprising them with um, this new approach, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Did you find that you got your fingers burnt a few times? I did. I got my fingers burnt a few times and um, that was really upsetting. Um, but, you know, it was I had to learn that hard lesson of you've got to meet the client where they're at. You can't sort of throw them in the deep end with this information. It's too it's too confronting. It's such a paradigm shift. It's not like you're giving them a different exercise or a different shiny placebotron treatment which they would you know accept it's just so different from what they expect a physio to do and I completely appreciate why they you know didn't want that um, from me um, so yeah I did get my fingers burnt a few times and I think that's part of the journey of working out how to you know blend this into that type of setting so I'm still, you know, working on that. Um, but that's why I find it easier to do the Zoom work because people who come to me on Zoom have already, you know, read the books. They understand they've got a mind-body problem, probably. And, and so they're already, you know, off, off the starting line and ready to explore this concept, um, from, you know, which is easier. <laughs> You're absolutely right. If somebody has a belief system that uh, has almost shifted, so they're coming to you to discuss uh, a different approach to dealing with their pain. They're practically already there sometimes. Yes. <clears throat> and I think um, that front end stuff where the excite a lot of the excitement is mm -hmm. and you get this new information, it makes you more excited. But actually you're coming across people who are very excited. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. But their nervous system is based in fear or frustration it's that and if you what i what i've recognized in my experience was that i had to control my own nervous system yes yes me too before they came into the room yes because exactly. what they the communication is very rarely verbal mm -hmm. they're in a heightened state otherwise they won't be walking through the door Yes. Because they've done the Google and they've got the cultural beliefs and they've got this physical uh, mm -hmm. experience and they've got uh, visual, uh, physical changes. Yes. It's yes. absolutely reality. Yes. And, um, you're presenting with an excitement yes. <laughs> about something that's like you're, two, you're a two-headed person. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and all you do, what well, I recognise, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm just scaring them. Yes, it's just too much. And that's right. And that I've really kind of sort of settled into myself a little bit more and, and I'm much more now... I am not coming at it in that excited energy. I'm a bit more kind of more grounded in the energy and a little bit, I'm a less, I'm a less attached to them needing to know, to believe it. I'm like, I'll present it calmly and they can take it or leave it. And I, I tell them they can take it or leave it, you know, and they can see one of the other physios if they, if they want the piriformis massaged and the exercises, for example, then, you know, I, I completely have that conversation with them. Um, but then I, I I come at it with with a much calmer energy, and that's that's making it easier to deliver and be accepted at the other end. And I had to I had to get over that hump of my overexcitement and then sort of settle into this way of being as um, as time has gone on. But what I find really interesting um, working in private practice, of course, I get people with acute injuries, 
And I can see the neuroplastic conditions straight off the bat, you know, with, within a few days. I'm like, okay, that's neuroplastic straight away. <laughs> and if you listen to the history, yes. my back went, it's my back has just head. gone. I lifted yeah. a I lifted a sock. Yeah. yeah. Turned my head. I think it's the mattress. It's yes. in the family. Yes. And uh, oh. yeah, all of that. It's classic, yeah. isn't it? The problem is the resources all talk about chronic pain. So it's hard to share resources with people in acute pain. Um, and, and that makes it quite tricky. Um, but yeah, you can, you don't have to wait for the pain to be three months to be deemed neuroplastic. <laughs> no, and I don't think you have to wait for to instill some of the patterns of recovery from persistent pain, uh, with with the acute pain if you make it a very passive process you're in trouble you're creating a problem for them yes Maybe exactly. you don't touch there's a big don't touch don't touch agenda which i think is pretty it's a pretty poor approach to look at yeah uh, physio if you like but because uh, yes. they misunderstand the whole process i think yeah. um but uh you have to use uh, all the approaches that the grandmother would use for the grandchild Yes. Yeah. So the child walks away with no pain, with blood coming down the leg, doesn't it? And all the events happened, and the back playing with the friends, and the same approach, uh, including touch and listening to someone and talking and different thought processes. The quicker you can get them into the rest and digest state in the presence of their problem, yeah. pain, actual injury, real event, yeah. they'll help, they'll recover themselves. Yeah, that's right, and because. Uh, it's all based on fear and, and the anxiety on the meaning they put to their symptoms and how it's going to affect their life. And they've already decided all this in their mind and they've got carried away with all these fears and what their Googles told them and what their partners told them and what the, the gym instructors told them. And, and they've got all this information, which is often um, inaccurate and scary and um, therefore reinforcing the focus and the fear which then, as we know, um, increases the symptoms um, and, and maintains the symptoms, um, which is interesting. And the, I mean, the biggest, the biggest challenge is people misunderstand you if you say it's a neural pathway problem. Um, I, I usually say it's a neural pathway problem rather than in the brain at first, because I think that's, they misunderstand that. I just sort of say it's the neural pathways um, just in order to them not to say think or hear oh you're saying it's all in my head and that's such a a misunderstanding well that, that's touching on some of the questions i'm going to come to so hold that thought. Any more there, then. hold that thought really hold that thought <laughs> so, um i can see how you your my my kind of journey 25 years physio very, very similar to yours to be honest and um i like to talk about it and to patients or to anyone who wants to listen really <clears throat> and you did a really nice talk to, professional talk i saw recently and i'll put the link in in this intro somewhere so people can watch that if they want it's it's a professional presentation but it's very understandable from uh for anybody who watches it if they're interested so um what about um, your personal experience, you the patient, because this is a separate really this issue, situation. You had like um, Raynaud's, uh, oh, it's, it's described as Raynaud's disease. It's, is it in the autoimmune bracket, or Raynaud's or not? Is well, it, it, it is in that... You know, Rheumatological. Yeah, they, 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 you'd go to a rheumatologist if you had it, in, which might put it in the rheumatological stroke it, um yeah autonomic sort of thing yeah. um, basically i don't know they don't know where they put they don't know what category to put it in perhaps right. and and this disease title is you know it's not a disease um it's a syndrome so it, it sounds awful when it's a disease like it's something that you can catch off somebody but um um but not but yeah so i don't know about you but when i am um, fortunately i've not had um chronic pains or symptoms as such so but when I did the training of course you want to try out all this information on yourself you know be your own guinea pig before you you know torture other people with it so I, I was think my I had two things that were you know chronically annoying to me which was my rain outs and my um my long-sightedness I always get it short my long-sightedness so I was wearing reading glasses so I thought well these are two things that maybe I could apply these principles so with the Raynaud's um it Raynaud's is when you um get exposed well not necessarily but in response to the cold trigger for me uh, my fingers would go 
painfully white and my feet would go painfully white. Um, and so I'm the type of person who loves outdoor sports. So every time I was skiing or cycling or walking in this country or, you know, in the snow conditions, I would get this, these painful hands and feet, which was really unpleasant. It didn't stop me doing the activities. I just, you know, had this symptom, you know, it was annoying and, and uncomfortable, but it wasn't terrible. And it's the type of symptom that people don't often go for treatment for because it's kind of something you can put up with to a degree. You can still do your activities. Um, and, and one day I was skiing with a GP who also had this condition and he says, oh, you know, try these medication, nifedipine. And nifedipine um, dilates the circulation to your peripheral um, tissue so it, it takes away the symptoms and for the first time in my life I went skiing without pain it was like oh this is incredible um, but then I thought I don't want to take a drug every time I go out into um, into the cold but I don't, didn't want to do that but so when I was um, considering that I could use this work what happened was um, my husband knows I hate the cold and so he thinks it's really funny to put his cold hands on my rib cage one morning um, in, in, a, in a February a couple of years ago and, and I, he put his hands on my chest and I just screamed out I hate the cold and I went oh okay that's and I just sat down at that moment I thought yeah I hate the cold and I, I knew that but it just kind of came to a head when I said that and I sat down and I said to myself why do I hate the cold and then this memory popped up um, which I hadn't sort of thought about of when I was about I had to check with my mum how old it was about eight and I was um I lived in Brisbane and we went to the snowy mountains and New South Wales and I'd never seen snow before and I think I was probably overexcited by this the sight of snow and and my dad thought it'd be funny to push me down this icy slope in my jeans um and so we did that and it was really cold I can, I can recall the cold you know sensation of my bum now when I think about it but it wasn't that that you know I don't think it was that what was the problem it was just a cold unpleasant sensation what happened next was I had these very wet jeans and we were walking around this tourist area and with my younger brother four years younger than me and um it looked like I'd wet my pants and I'm an eight-year-old girl and I'm highly embarrassed by the fact that it looks like I wet my pants and I just had to walk around town like that and, and my brother was probably teasing me and you know this sort of thing so I was acutely uncomfortable and embarrassed about that so I believe my that was a priming event in my nervous system my nervous system at that lovely age of eight you know it's really taking on its learnings about how to help me keep safe in the world and I think my nervous system at that moment thought cold is dangerous it makes her feel really embarrassed and shameful and horrible so we must remind her that the cold is a bad thing um so then scroll forward 10 years later and I went skiing in Australia when I was about 18 and I and I got cold hands and feet but I just thought it was because I had poor equipment you know and I didn't really I hadn't had any rain outs up until this point because I hadn't been in the cold I was living in Brisbane but I didn't get exposed to the cold um and then and then I came over to England and then I went skiing here, for example, and then I got and I had proper kit on then and uh, I still got this painful hands and feet. And so that was the first time I experienced Raynaud's was probably when I was about 18. And then it wasn't anything that bothered me particularly, but as these things go, they tend to get worse over time. And then I started thinking about um, so after my husband did this and I thought, oh, I can see where the priming event was. Um, and we were about to go on holidays with some friends in the Lake District. This is in like end of February. So it was going to be cold. And, and I had this idea that in two weeks time, I'm going walking in the Lake District. I wonder if I can get rid of my rain outs for that. And I just had this challenge. Now, what I think people need to understand is I had full belief. I had this energy of, ah, this rain outs, this is an autonomic problem this is my autonomic nervous system which which controls the circulation to my hands and feet it's being overreactive to the cold so I knew if this is my autonomic nervous system overacting to the cold based on information in my subconscious brain that the cold is dangerous this is exactly what the mind body sort of approach can address so I got very excited about the possibility that this could happen and I had a strong belief about that 
Um, and so I went about applying the techniques. So I, I journaled to my dad and my brother, just, just a quick letter kind of, you know, expressing from a point of view of an eight-year-old to kind of offload the emotional charge that was in my system. Um, and I forgave them for, you know, I kind of understood why they did it and forgave them for that and let that go. Um, I then looked at my language and around the cold and I noticed how often in conversation I would whinge about the cold, complain about the cold. And I realized this is just continuing to feed that information. And so I completely reframed the cold as something that was exhilarating. It made me feel alive. You know, it was a sensory experience, which was strong, but but, you know, it was OK. So I did I did a lot of change in my self-talk. Um, I started doing visualization techniques to visualize um, increasing the blood flow to my hands and feet whilst in a cold environment. So literally trying to tell my autonomic nervous system to let the blood flow into my hands and feet. I did a few techniques like that. Um, and, and then I, I completely took my fear away about the cold. I decided it wasn't anything to be feared. And it wasn't that I was scared of the cold. This is the thing. It, it, my nervous system was scared of the embarrassment, you know, with that emotional re response to the cold, um, which is interesting. So anyway, we came up to this, this, this trip away and the weather was horrendous. It was driving rain and fog and everything like that. And normally I'd be in the car going, oh, no, it's you know going to get cold. But I just like bring it on. I don't mind. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just go for it. And I did a bit of visualization in the car, just my hands being warm. And um, I went on this walk and I was just, I really enjoyed the cold. Like the weather was terrible. But I was like, oh, it's just incredible, this weather. And I really kind of turned it into something exhilarating and exciting instead of fearful, you know, turning that adrenaline into perceiving that as something positive in my nervous system. And um, so I did this walk and I, at the end, like I took my, you know, took my gloves off and said to my husband, look, I've had no rain outs and, you know, this is amazing. And then two weeks later, I was skiing with some girlfriends um, in, in Europe. And I thought, well, this is the ultimate test, getting to a ski field. And then I've got, I went to skiing and I didn't take any nifedipine. And I've got a picture at the top of the mountain in minus 10 degrees. You can see the temperature and my hands are absolutely fine. So I just knew I'd like, okay, this is good. But I wanted to take it further because Actually, the cold is more um, penetrable when you're in water. Cold water is even worse than being in cold air. So, so later that year, um, we were supposed to go to Australia, but it was um, COVID lockdown. So we went to Scarborough instead, which was an obvious choice at this point. <laughs> and, um, and it was in September. We went swimming in the sea. And again, wow, my hands and my feet are fine. And the ultimate choice is then I decided to do Wim Hof. I thought, how far can I take this, you know? And I, I did a sort of a Wim Hof course and then I exposed myself to really cold temperatures and I just got the normal response, you know, that you would get, um, you know, you get cold hands and feet, but I didn't get the rain outs. I didn't get the overreaction of my nervous system. I got the normal reaction of my autonomic nervous system to the cold. And so then I knew, right, I have absolutely cracked this now. And it was just so exciting to think that I've changed something that the medical profession would say is incurable, um, you know, which it is. If you try and treat it medically, you can only treat the symptoms by giving nifedipine. And that's because they don't understand the reason for it from a autonomic nervous system fear, you know, pro neural programming point of view sort of thing. So it felt uh, very exciting to do that. It's it really is fascinating. You 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 you, in, you seem inspired by it. Mm, yeah, very much so. It felt really powerful to. I've changed my nervous system. It just shows you, you know, we have got so much power to change. You know, the medical profession would say we don't have any control over our autonomic nervous system. It's an autonomic nervous system. We don't have conscious control. And but I I didn't it wasn't conscious control it was subconscious control I changed if you like by changing the beliefs and I think the beliefs that sit in our subconscious brain uh, are, are very fundamental to how our nervous system responds to the environment and our thoughts and and everything else so um, that was really exciting to experience that for myself. The hard part for people is that the beliefs they hold they're unconscious of them. Yes, they're implanted at, at below the age of seven generally. 
So they're not yeah. actually aware of the thoughts. They've developed a physical reaction to that belief system. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of this uh, cause and effect. They're only feeling the reaction as a animalistic uh, being. But that it's basically stuck in fight, flight, freeze or fawn, isn't it? Yes. And that'll develop some traits that we see that are classic in that population that we can all have. We all do have. But at the time in the life of overload, those behaviours are, are automatically triggered to be the fastest way to feel better in the stress situation. They will work quickly. Uh, fight, flight, freeze or fawn, they'll always work quickly, but they won't last. And then the behaviour itself, because it's exhausting, it becomes painful. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it's like very logical very very logical so there's always a reason for pain every pain there's always an absolute reason for it i agree, I agree. yes it's yeah. um the cause and effect which you described perfectly the nervous system which is a learning uh learn so fast far faster than the conscious mind and, and far more things than we can ever imagine it associates uh how can we protect our cells as an eight-year-old organism, it doesn't think consciously like this. This is how can I survive this situation where I'm feeling this unpleasant sensation that you might have named embarrassment or physically that might look like blushing or the blood flow to the organism. That's a real threat. Mm, yeah. I may not survive this feeling. Yes. <laughs> if it goes on much longer, because the child can't rationalise, oh, dad just did it for a bit of fun and this will pass and uh, I haven't <laughs> wet myself and nobody, <laughs> people are laughing, but it doesn't matter. Because if you went there and fell now with your jeans on walking, I don't know how old you're really, but you're not eight, <laughs> you wouldn't be going, oh, oh, everyone thinks I've wet myself. Oh, I feel terrible. Because you can regulate that because yes. you've got cognition and a prefrontal cortex that can, oh, one of those things, I'll push him back over. But at eight, mm. the nervous system, how can we prevent this ever happening again? Now, if there's a yellow taxi going past at the time mm. and a, a person with a beard who pushed you mm. and uh, there's a dog barking, it was an Alsatian, mm. Don't be surprised if somebody watching this has pain or symptoms or something that comes up. If they have that dog back and the person with the beard pushes them, surprise, surprise, you get the same symptoms in the absence of any pathological problem that looks as if it is that problem. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's right. Sometimes when um, someone's pain seems to, they can't really explain it, it's because their subconscious has detected a threat and it, it could be something subtle like that, like yeah, a sound or a, a person's what they're wearing that kind of triggers them below their conscious awareness that reminds their nervous system of something fearful that they need protection from. And the whole thing, it's not just a memory. It's essentially like a panic attack, isn't it? The yeah. whole system goes and people say, how can it swell? How can it bruise? How can it discolor? Well, it's the, the the brain and parts of it. It's just like a flip switch, isn't it? The amygdala can switch on the, me the all the associated feelings of the memory. Yes, yes, yeah. And your journaling process for people, <clears throat> I'm not an expert in journaling, or, but what I what I understand of it is that uh, you are, you're a source, you go back to the memory that has these feelings and physiological processes attached. And I think the moment you hold the pen and write, you bring yourself to the present moment where actually there isn't any danger. So the memory now gets attached to safety. Mm. And the feelings, uh, whether you say or you talk, is kind of metabolized through that moment. So the next time you touch, attach yourself to the memory, there's less power in the feelings, something yeah. like that. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds very plausible. I hadn't thought about it like that. The way I like to think about it as well is like these sort of fears and 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 thoughts and beliefs and emotions are like swirl like in an eddy current in the system almost. And I almost conceptualize that when you put your pen on the page and you move, it kind of runs out That's uh, nice. the page and then you throw it in the bin. It's kind of you move it out of here into, oh, you know, it kind of. You let it go, sort of thing. Um, oh, that's a lovely, that's a really nice visualization, that isn't yeah. it? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, as we've come to talk about uh, pathology and uh, Reynolds is it like a, a classic mind body condition, yeah. if you like, um, and we know there's a, 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 a 
the whole scope of them. And you and I are seeing them in acute settings mm -hmm. that's, that um, it, you, you treat the acuteness of it. Yes. We yeah. try to plant suggestions to yeah. prevent maybe the language you, I know I used in the past yeah. that I, would, I wouldn't dream of using again. No, no, you know, no. you graduate and that. I don't criticize myself. It's all we're all learning, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So now uh, we get to the stage where you, you feel well equipped to deal with the quite challenging questions that patients mm. present. Can I ask you some? Yeah. Fire away. <laughs> Go on, Emily. <laughs> don't need to calm myself first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I used, I take three slow breaths. Oh, thank you. Okay. If my patient comes in the room, I just, uh, yeah, yeah. Three slow I, breaths. I do too, because when you're in that ex activated state, your prefrontal cortex where your knowledge is goes offline. So you have to kind of calm the nervous system down to bring your wisdom and clarity forward in order to, you know, answer the questions. So I'm ready for you. Ready? I love it. Love it. I love it. Do you know what I said? I said it yesterday. I said three people yesterday because I'm presenting the idea in an acute setting. Because yeah. if you win there, if you win, it's amazing. It's yes. exhilarating in the moment. Yes. It's And yeah. I had two or three wins yesterday, and the patient's yeah. like, I can't believe it's a light bulb. And uh, But what I say to them is as I'm presenting this information, they say, oh, I say, am I stressed? They say, no. I say, well, I am quite stressed, but I'm, I've chosen this. I'm quite enjoying it. But I'm not going to be at 8 o'clock tonight like I was when I first qualified <laughs> every yeah. night of the week. Yeah. just to feel better about myself i said i've got about 25 years worth of knowledge in here and most of it's a load of rubbish yeah <laughs> and i've got to try and pull yeah. out stuff that I, and present it to you so you can yeah. say drew that's a load of rubbish yeah. oh actually you know i think something in that and that, that's normally quite a winner <laughs> exactly oh, i know we've got to um you know i've become much more aware of how much fear information health professionals give to clients and they come and they say you know the doctor told me you know blah 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 which would be like something very scary a lot of fear information seems to be given without the awareness of the impact you know and people hang on to those words particularly when they come from a, a well-respected health professional and if that well-respected health professional has given them no hope and told them this is only going to get worse you could end up in a wheelchair yet you know you're just going to have to manage the pain and take these pain you know that is um, terrifying and uh, puts the patient in a very helpless sort of situation. And um, and you think, was it really necessary to say that, to give people no hope? You know, it's I find it quite upsetting how, um, how potentially damaging those comments can be and, when, and they're being delivered without awareness of that impact because they don't understand that the mind-body um, <laughs> system, which takes that information on, increases fear, which increases the pain. You're absolutely right. And hopefully that language and, and uh, perspective will change with time. Maybe it won't, but, you know, hopefully voices like yours are going to help it. So I'm going to listen to some really uh, challenging answer, uh, answers to some challenging questions. They might not be challenging to you, but they are to me sometimes. So can I just face some at you? Yeah, go off, go for it. Why, why is my pain, why is it happened to me then? Why have I got chronic pain, really? What, why would it happen to me? Yeah, I know. I know it feels really unfair and it feels like, you know, you've been picked out and you're looking around thinking, why is that person? I'm a good person. I've got chronic pain. Why isn't that person got chronic pain probably? And it's because we're all so unique and um, it depends on how your the environment, the garden your nervous system was grown in, for example. Uh, when you're growing up and your nervous system, your, particularly your protective nervous system, your autonomic nervous system, when, it, when you're growing up, it's, it's working out what is safe and what is dangerous in the world. And if your experiences um, when you were growing up gave you fearful information, which kind of primed your um, autonomic nervous system into more a tendency towards danger mode, um, then you're going to maybe react to things as an adult differently to someone else. And because it's not your fault that you're in chronic pain, it's, it's exactly just if anyone else was in your shoes and, and had your life, they would have chronic pain as well. It's to do with the environment you grew up in, the information, the experiences um, that you had, any traumas, any beliefs that were instilled into your nervous system. Um, and then that kind of loads the gun, if you like, so that that can be triggered 
um, in later life. And, and sometimes the trigger is an injury. Sometimes the trigger is just an innocuous movement. Sometimes the trigger is, you know, very um, benign. Um, but the gun's already loaded from previous learnings in your nervous system. And because we know it's in your nervous system um, and that can change because it's neuroplastic, the good news is it, it doesn't matter that you grew up in that environment and your nervous system learned these things. They can be unlearned um, for the future. Good stuff, early. <laughs> if someone uh, uh, hears he that and says, yeah, but I've got, I can feel it and I can see it. Are you saying I'm making it up? Yeah. Is, is it, this is a classic one. Are you saying it's in my head? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely not. The, what you're feeling and what you're experiencing is in your body. Um, it's not in your head unless you've got a migraine, a headache, of course. Um, but you've got real sort of, you know, feelings of tenderness and tension in your body and, and you're experiencing it in your body. What, what the difference is, it's being experienced in the body, but it's not being caused by damage or disease of those tissues. It's being signaled by pathways in the brain. So we're not we're not disputing that you've got these symptoms and signs in your body. We can test for it. We can feel it. You can produce that pain um, with certain movements, no doubt. But the argument is the cause of that is not tissue damage. It's the cause is neural pathways coming from the brain. So even if I have proof of degenerate disc or I've got degeneration in the tendon or arthritis, are you saying I can recover? Absolutely, because um, we know, I know, I know personally in my family and in my clients, people who've got all those changes and don't have pain. And so if, if there's exceptions to the rule, then it's not a rule. Uh, so if, the, if you can have degeneration and no pain, um, and you can have pain without degeneration, it means degeneration or tendonitis is not the cause of your pain uh, in most cases. Uh, so uh, these are normal age changes and they're not pathological in terms of producing pain. And yet and arthritis is, is probably the biggest one to challenge because people believe that. But even I like to point out that if you've got arthritis, yes, it changes the shapes of the joints, surfaces. It might reduce your range of movement, but having less movement doesn't create pain. Uh, and you might have, and the structural changes are there all the time, and they don't change very quickly. They're like glaciers. They change very slowly. And yet you can have some days when you don't have pain or you can do an activity that's the same on that joint or tissue and it's painful one day and not the X the other day and if the pain's changing like that and the structure's staying the same your pain is not due to the structure good stuff mm -hmm. it's relevant but it isn't the cause and effect isn't it that's right that's right can i take you back to an earlier question yeah explore it a little bit so this is what i find uh interesting when people say uh, childhood was perfect yeah. nothing wrong nothing happened nothing happened at all <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's a, a, a good one. Um, it's really interesting this. I've had some clients with this perfect childhood um, and it can produce a pressure uh, for that child to feel like I've got these really good parents and there's a big expectation, which the child puts on themselves um, to think I've got to be the perfect child. Um, I've got to please them. They might end up even going and studying something they think their parents would respect them for and not follow their heart and dreams. And I've seen that cause um, um, trouble for, and create be the basis for chronic symptoms and their body saying no effectively when they're doing what, what they think they should do, which is is not in coherence with what they love and want to do. So even having that perfect childhood can inadvertently create a situation in the child who's trying to live up to this ideal, um, which is very, puts a lot of pressure on the nervous system and, and can create a lot of tension when you're trying to, you know, be something you're not and, and not being authentically relaxed in how you are and thinking you're having to raise your game in order to continue that praise and, and love um, from your parents sort of thing. So that's one thing, but also I think people um, can minimize and not fully understand the impact of some aspects of their childhood. Things like they might say they've had got, you know, had wonderful family and, and it's, it's wonderful if they have. And unfortunately, it seems to be quite rare amongst the, the chronic pain community. You know, it's rarer for people to say I had a perfect childhood. 
Um, but for the ones that do, it could be that they were bullied at school, for example. Um, so we've got to take that into consideration. Or maybe they had a really hypercritical football coach who kind of they felt diminished by. And, um, you know, so it can be something outside the home um, or it could be they've got um, a sibling in the house who had medical problems that there was a lot of attention that had to go towards that that sibling. And that created different pressures for, for this person. Um, and it can be more subtle, more subtle, pre more subtle um situations and only when you kind of explore and get under the veneer of the I had a perfect childhood and ask a few more questions um, and and even if you say to them well if, if they've got children if your child had your childhood would, would would that be good as well if you have to sort of stimulate a bit more kind of inquiry into the details of their childhood sometimes that can evoke um, maybe a different perspective than they had before. Yeah, because not everyone's comfortable going backwards, are they? No, no. And I don't, don't think everyone has to. No, and I think they can be uncomfortable if they think it's some sort of blame game or, you know, we're looking for fault. We're not looking for blame or fault. We're looking to understand what it was their nervous system was learning and taking in. And if we can understand the messages and the and the um, learnings that their nervous system was having and informing what type of personality they needed to create to feel safe. And, and you know, that helps us understand what needs to be addressed um, as an adult when they're suffering with symptoms. Well, you're such a compassionate uh, person, really. I can uh, I feel as if you, if I was a patient in front of you, I'd get, I'd, you know, I feel like I get it anyway, but I'm absolutely getting it again. <laughs> what, what was this one? Why does the pain come where it comes? Yeah, well, that's so interesting. Um, it, uh, that's something that I find interesting as a clinician. And I think I have to be careful not to make assumptions about that and then maybe, you know, go down the wrong track. Um, I think there can be very metaphorical reasons why people get pain in certain areas. Um, things like frozen shoulders could be not, you know, not wanting to let go or, you know, trying to take control or neck pain can be, you know, taking on over responsibility and the, got the weight of the world of looking after everybody else's emotional problems on your shoulders, literally, you know, back pain could be, you know, you're feeling, you know, unsupported or financial pressure, you know, so you do start to see some sort of anecdotally some, some themes amongst your patients that seem but but not always so I, that's why I keep a bit of an open mind and I'm curious about those and I might use that to inquire but I don't it's not a definite you know it's not that every person who has a shoulder pain has got that going on there's, there's more um, variety than that but I do see that different areas of the body do seem to you know have themes coming through the more and more I see more and more patients I start to see that do you do you see that as well exactly as that yeah shoulders I feel a stubbornness yeah, yeah. so I don't say that absolutely yeah. shoulders are stubborn frozen yeah. shoulders definitely uh neck got the world of the shoulders I don't see IBS and, uh, you know, the, the other man's musculoskeletal, but people will mention IBS. And so it's things they can't stomach or yes, yes. they'll often have chest things that can't get off the chest. The cardiac is uh, a broken heart yeah. uh, connection. Often that, yes. Yeah, yes. palpitations, cardiac, so it's a really distressed relationship, uh, love, uh, feet, plantar fasciitis is just... Uh, the the whole world again on the pushing through tendonitis pushing through using a physical mechanism to fight yeah. uh, knee problems unsupported again hip relationship yes uh, yeah i definitely found the hip relationship um pelvic I, I don't deal i don't see much pelvic pain but mother mother daughter relationships and and I, i'm not i'm not skilled in abuse or anything like that and i don't want to say that pelvic pain is always linked to that but it, it relates to the part of the body where the distress is felt very much so very much so it's not my bag that one but i'm just kind of musing no. yeah really. oh no it's really it's really interesting to <laughs> kind of see that isn't that and also obviously there's other reasons why people get it in a certain place you know because they'll say oh they'll get it in their back because their parents had it in their back and they kind of expect it's going to be you know hereditary so then they've already got that fear this nervous system knows they're scared of back pain so when a fear comes up it knows exactly where to send the alarm bell um, to get their attention because they've already got a bit of a fear belief somewhere in their body anyway so it can be you know when you often ask people about 
what conditions their family has, it's probably every time or very, very frequently, they would say, oh, if they if they're coming in with back pain, their dad had back pain or if they're coming with shoulder pain, you know, it's there's you often see that and they might put that down to genetics or something like that. But I'm more inclined to put that down to learned um, sort of um, fears uh, about. Well, there's uh, no genetic link for that, is there? No, really? exactly. And um, isn't it scary, though, when said, oh, my dad had a operation, I think I'm going to need one. Yeah. Sometimes people are unstoppable. And that's, I think, gosh, mm. it's like, wow. Uh, so that learned pattern is is really strong, isn't it? Very really strong. strong. And, and I've just recently read a brilliant book called The Expectation Effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and just the power of what you believe to change your cellular level. If you give instructions, the you know, I had a patient just recently, her mum had osteoporosis and, and her grandmother had osteoporosis and, and she's got a kyphosis and, and she's been telling herself that she's going to get osteoporosis. And I was explaining to her, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case that you're almost contagiously sending down these fear messages. And she admitted she'd been telling the same thing to her daughter, you know, that you've got to be careful about this and blah, blah, blah. And, and you just, you just pass the fear down through the generations and the expectation that you've seen what's happened to your mother and grandmother. And it's pretty scary. And then all that fear uh, then kind of feeds into your nervous system, which probably increases its chance of happening. when you realize that, I can change my thoughts and beliefs and that's going to change my physiology. Wow. You know, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Those two aspects, you explain them really well. I always think that if someone, in addition to those two, I say there's four. So in addition to those two, if they've had actual trauma, so they broke the leg when they were a certain age, that was a very stressful moment as they broke their leg. Even if the leg's not actually causing them any problem, it's something that was wired to lots of fear, lots of frustration, lots of couldn't play sport, lots of self-criticism or whatever. They couldn't live up to the ideal of who they believe should be. So at another point in life where they can't live up to who they believe should be and they're fearful and frustrated, that connection can often be a trigger. Do you see that too? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, when you when you speak to anybody about what was going on when their pain came on, and then you look back into their childhood to see if there's a common theme. Yes, you can see where the priming event was, you know, like I had my priming event. And you can see why, because in the present moment, it seems like that event's a bit innocuous, like, you know, why did my back pain start then? But then you can see the themes around it and see that that theme was planted as a as a dangerous, a dangerous stress. And, and as I like to say to people, it's it's not stress per se, which causes your symptoms. It's whether the stressful events specifically had a danger message in it, which was pertinent to your nervous system. Um, so that you might have stress about the mother-in-law and that co not cause you symptoms, but you might have stress about your shouting boss, which reminds you of your shouty um, father. And that brings on your migraines, um, but not your mother-in-law's stress, if you see what I mean. So it's yeah. very specific to the danger message in the stressor, yeah. um, not just globally the stress as such. Although having said that, if you have got a lot of stress in your life, um, you create this overwhelm um, of lots of things going on and you exceed your capacity, which then the body can say no and produce symptoms to kind of take you out of some of that stress that you're experiencing in your life. Yeah, and that exceeding your capacity uh that points to that or the last mechanism that i think is if you always go to the gym when uh you finish work but then you finish work uh and you're just getting divorced and your parents are ill and the dog's at your own work and you're going to lo lose your job you're going to hit the gym even yes. more yes. and that behavior eventually will create pain because it'll never resolve this overload here yes. and eventually you won't be able to go to the gym <laughs> No, and that's right. And, and, and that's another, you know, pain so complex, there's so many different things. And it, the more we talk, there's, there's all these different mechanisms. But for example, I was speaking to a friend recently and she was saying she was getting pain playing tennis. So she'd get it in a shoulder, then she'd get it in a back and then she'd get it in a knee and she'd have to stop playing. And she tennis is something she'd played for a long time. So it wasn't an unusual activity. She didn't suddenly start doing more tennis. She didn't start changing her technique. So there, was, there wasn't any kind of physical reason why she was getting these pains. So then I asked her, um, well, when you're playing tennis, you know, 
what's going on in your head are you enjoying it you know is it something that you know is there something going on in your life so that when you go in to play tennis you're in a bit of a wound up state so your nervous system's wound up your muscles are all tense and then you're doing something using your muscles and trying to reach and stretch but you're in a state of wind up in the first place so you're more likely to um kind of you know put it more more stress through your musculoskeletal system and also what's going on in your mindset. And she admitted that when these pains started, when she thought about it, she thought about what was going on in her life at the same time. And there were very good reasons why her system was wound up. But also um, when she played tennis, she was realized she was so highly critical of herself. So every time she did a bad shot, she would attack herself with that was rubbish. And what does that do to your nervous system when you're self attacking yourself? It's as if someone else is standing there telling you how rubbish you are. You go into defense, which creates that tension, that that sort of um, bracing in your body. And then if you're bracing your body and you're trying to play a sport, you know, you're going to start getting um, pains in your body for sure. And interestingly, because it was so uncomfortable that when she was playing tennis, it was making her feel like she was just a crap person. The pain meant she couldn't play tennis, which meant she didn't get to feel that that I'm a crap person anymore. The pain removed her from experiencing that self-criticism. So it, the nervous system is just trying to protect us. The pain is trying to protect us from these really uncomfortable feelings about ourselves a lot of the time. And when we realize that, we think, oh, nervous system, thank you. You were really trying to protect me there. Um, I, and I need to stop attacking you so you don't have to protect me anymore, you know. So how is she? Uh, well, like I say, she's a friend. So, you know, I don't treat her as a client. I just put the little seed in there. And um... yeah. Those closest to us, they're the hardest to, they don't want to listen to us, do they? Yeah. No, Last one. So so for those that do want uh, help, and yeah. I get it, really, all that you've said to me, so what can I do about it? I know that you can't answer that in one fell swoop, but just how would you summarise? How, how could I help myself then if I've got this situation? I understand everything you said. What do I do? Okay. So... First of all, you have to realize there's not a quick fix. It's not like do these three exercises, off you go. So it's it's first of all, just managing your expectation that this is like, you know, learning the piano. You wouldn't expect to be able to play a symphony after one lesson. So be prepared for the fact that there's going to be some new learnings to do. So the most important thing is to reduce your fear. And the fear comes from misinformation and beliefs about your symptoms, um, about your emotions, um, about the effect this is going to have in your life. So, you know, I would often start working with you to understand what all your fears are so we can bring safety and, and accurate science to those fears and doubts, which will then mean you change the meaning of these symptoms. So you can understand that these symptoms in your body are actually a message from your nervous system that there's something, you know, creating danger in your world and and that may not be physical it could be emotional or social or psychological or a combination of all of these so it's about us understanding why your nervous system is detecting fear addressing that fear and um, with this information giving you the empowerment to get back moving again rewire your nervous system um, become comfortable with accessing uncomfortable emotions and being able to process them rather than keeping them stuck inside your body. Uh, and, and looking at areas of your life with your personality where you might be putting stress on. So there's, there's lots of different areas to work on, but um, the good news is we need to work on all of those. But when we do that, I, I kind of say it's, it's kind of like an eight digit code for a lock. You can't just do one of those things. The lock's still stuck, but each one in combination when we treat it in this very kind of holistic way will then you know lead to um, the freedom um, and it's a process as you go along you you start to feel those changes you view your pain in a different way and you get you gain momentum as you go along with that oh well really it's honestly it's been fantastic to listen to your story and your expertise and your experience and your wise words I'm sure you're going to get wiser with time, but I'm amazed. It's brilliant <laughs> to listen to you. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to speak with you, Drew. And I hope um, there's some value in, in what we've had to talk about today for people. Are you happy for people to contact you? If I put your contact details on yes. in the spread or uh, in the 
the kind of bio part just to your yeah. contact details Absolutely. i know that you're a surf practitioner that's there's a, a website but you have a um your own business that you work independently yes but my work my website is in con, under construction as we speak but um yes you, you know my contact details are on the surfer website and the practitioner um site or you can share my email for people if they want to get in touch with me i'd be delighted um to receive receive that Oh, well, I think um, uh, there'll be plenty of people who uh, spend half an hour or so watching uh, you and they get a flavour of what you say and um, they'll be knocking on your door early. <laughs> well, they're not allowed to because I'm going on holidays in a few weeks' time. <laughs> well, it's, is it, I always think content like this is evergreen. So it's we you, you throw it out there and people can kind of cast their eye over it, maybe make a cup of tea and have a watch of it. And it has to capture people's imagination and and think oh that's in and capture their interest and it has to resonate with them it has to be the right time for it to land as well doesn't it yeah. totally totally but thank you for sharing all this content that i'll share with the community that i uh work with and uh, i'm very grateful for your time and i look forward to staying in touch with you uh, thank you, Joe. And it's great to be part of the opportunity of spreading the word. I feel so passionately about of pe more and more people knowing about this is a possibility. Uh, this is an avenue for people to give hope to recovery. So the more people that can hear about it and have the seed planted, uh, the better. Cheers. Thanks. Really. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.